first of all, you're all part of it here. And I'm really um, delighted to welcome colleagues, students, and guests to this lecture tonight, or Hugh Beale. Um, I'm particularly delighted to introduce Hugh, um, because on a personal note, he was the person who gave me my first break in academia. I was his research assistant for two years, many, many moons ago. Um, so it's really nice to be able to invite him back tonight as a friend. Um, you will all know that Hugh is a leading expert in the field of contract law. Um, he's an expert particularly um, on European contract law. He's a member of the Commission on European Contract Law from 1987 to 1999, and that led to the production of what is now a leading European contract law book um, in the field. Um, Hugh is also has the very prestigious position of being an editor of Chitty, um, so covering both European and domestic area. Um, another um, string to his bow is, of course, that he has been responsible for looking at the interface between theory and practice um, during his role as a law commissioner from 2000 to 2007, where he took uh, the lead in the commercial and contract law team uh, with many successes at the law commission. I'm told he tried his best to sort out unfair contract terms, but unfortunately those of us who are teaching the subject are still damned with the two parallel regulatory frameworks. Um, more recently, he's um, been made an honorary QC. He's also a fellow of the British Academy. For those LSE students in the audience, though, I think Hugh is best known as the editor of our favourite Cases and Materials textbook um, at the LSE, which is set on no less than two of our courses um, at undergraduate level. So it's with great pleasure, um, yeah, royalty is coming your way, Hugh, uh, that I welcome Hugh to talk about a European contract law, a cuckoo in the nest. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that very kind introduction and thank you also for the opportunity to talk to you about a project which I've been involved in for some time now and which is difficult and a little bit controversial and that's the future of a European contract law. And it's very nice to be able to have a chance, I hope, to discuss it with, with colleagues and friends. Um, we're used, I think, to the notion of a European contract law. After all, for a long time now, we've had, uh, we've had uh, directives, primarily in the consumer area, some of them purely regulatory, but many of them affecting private rights as well, some in the commercial law area. And of course, we've got regulations, particularly in the field of question of uh, private international law and jurisdiction. But we're really now talking about something rather different because, as you probably know, the European Commission is talking about introducing a common frame of reference. And as I'll explain later, they, there seem to be two separate ideas as to what this common frame of reference might be. It may be a guide or toolbox for legislators, I hope that the parliamentary draftsman can spell better than I can, I'm sorry about that, or courts. And secondly, it may be what they call an optional instrument, an optional regime for contract law, an alternative law instead of a national law to govern your contract, and specifically aimed at cross-border contracts. It's often referred to as a 28th legal system. Well, that, of course, is misleading, misleading in one sense because we already have 28 systems if you count the Scots, uh, and you certainly should, but also misleading because, as we'll see, they don't actually envisage it operating as a separate legal system. But that's a point I'll come back to in just a moment. But the basic question I want to ask is, do we need either of these things? And is either one actually a threat to English law, hence the, the cuckoo in the nest in the title? Now, I think we're used to the idea that it might be useful to have neutral sets of rules for international transactions. Although, of course, we haven't adopted it. Many countries have adopted the Vienna Convention on International Sales, and, and I'm told by the Siskites that it's actually doing rather well, thank you very much. And we're also used to the notion of international soft law, such as the Unigua principle of international contracts. And many of you will know that there have also been attempts within Europe to produce sets of principles, they're often called restatements of the law, for reasons I'll explain in just a moment. And I'm going to say that perhaps the best known one 
is the principles of European contract law, which were produced by the so-called Lando Commission, chaired by Professor Ole Lando. And the principles of European contract law come in two volumes. The first part covers sort of basic contract law formation, validity, and so on. And then there's a part three in the separate volume, which deals with associated topics like plurality of parties, assignment, and so on. And the, as you probably know, the basic approach is a functional one. That is, what the principles try to do is to strip away all the differences in concepts, difference in terminology between the various legal systems and look at the concrete results. And when you do that, you find that in a very high percentage of cases, actually the systems come to pretty much the same results, and those form the basis of the principles. But of course, in some cases that isn't true, and in that case the principle just has to put forward what the drafters thought was an acceptable solution or an acceptable compromise. And the principles of European contract law, if you look at them, they come in the form of a series of articles with a commentary and with comparative notes. And of course, I'm not the only person in the room who've been involved in this project. Michael did one of the chapters in, in, in volume three and contributed very largely to the project. Now, what's the purpose of these restatements? Well, of course, to some extent, they can just be an academic exercise. But apart from that, obviously, at the moment, private international law does not permit parties to contract except under a national system, even under the Rome regulation. You have to adopt a national law to govern your contract. You can adopt principles like the principles of European contract law or the Unidor principles as part of your contract, but that won't achieve the full effect because you're still going to be subject to the mandatory rules of whatever law is actually going to be the governing law. In business-to-business -business contracts, given that there aren't that many mandatory rules, that may not be a particular problem, but it obviously would be a problem in consumer law. On the other hand, many states allow arbitrators to decide cases not according to a national system. They can decide, for instance, on the basis of what is fair and equitable, on the basis of what is internationally accepted. And one of the ideas of these restatements, be it the Unidwar principles or the principles of European contract law, is to provide a modern statement of what is acceptable, a kind of modern lex mercatorium. And apart from that, the idea was that the principles of European contract law might be a model for law reform. And remember that they were published just at the time that many of the new democracies of Central Europe were actually thinking about reforming their civil codes. Many of them are still doing it. And I know that they read the principles of European contract law, even if they don't necessarily adopt them. And they might provide terminology and concepts for European community law. And also, lastly, act as a translation <coughs> tool, a way of finding your way from one legal system to another. If, for example, you want to know what the German law on misrepresentation is, you probably won't find misrepresentation even in a book in English about German law because it's not a category they work with. But if you can identify where it's dealt with in the principles of European contract law, then the comparative notes will lead you at least to the beginning of where you might want to look in German law. So they have a variety of uses. There's one other use which is only mentioned in one line in the introduction. That's because only some of the people involved agreed with it. But Professor Lando wanted the principles of European contract law ultimately to be the basis of a single European contract law. And there are other people in the field who clearly believe that that's the way forward. So we have a vast group chaired by Professor von Barr from Osnabrück, who was a member of the, of the Lando Commission, called the Study Group on a European Civil Code. And it's fairly clear what his agenda is. I would simply repeat that there are many people in that group who don't share the same agenda. They see it as a valuable ex academic exercise or possibly as have a, having other purposes, but they certainly don't want to see a European civil code. But it was a very large project, as you can gather from the topics on the slide. And you can see that it's not confined to contract law. It covers unjust enrichment, tort, and even a number of property subjects as well. Meanwhile, another group had been set up to take the existing consumer acquis. The existing acquis is fragmentary. It's not very well organized. You get, for example, inconsistencies between different directives. The acquis group, as they called themselves, headed by Professor Schulte-Nurka, who was at Bielefeld and is now at Osnabrück also, um, 
they decided to try to find the common principles that underlie the existing European legislation and produce something called the principles of existing EC private law. Now, what part was the Commission playing in all of this, the European Commission? Answer, apart from a little bit of funding that they gave Ole Lando right at the beginning, no interest at all until 2001, when they produced a consultation paper. And then in 2003, they produced their so-called action plan on a more coherent European contract law, which said that as a result of their consultation, they had concluded that differences between the laws of the member states did create additional costs, if not absolute barriers, to <coughs> cross-border trade, and therefore were hindering the internal market. And they suggested a number of things should be done. First of all, they should improve the existing acquis, using for that purpose what they called a common frame of reference. They should also promote EC or EU-wide contract terms. I'm not going to talk any more about that because they subsequently dropped the idea. But they should thirdly reflect on having an optional instrument. And in 2004, they produced another document called The Way Forward, which gave some more detail as to what was actually to happen. The common frame of reference was to be used to assist in a revision of the acquis. It was to set out common fundamental principles of contract law, definitions of key concepts, and model rules. And it might, and this is the second strand, might form the basis of a possible optional instrument or instruments in the plural. Meanwhile, eight consumer directives were to be reviewed, and as we'll see later on, that produced a green paper in 2007. But perhaps, most importantly for this bit of the story, the Commission said we don't want to start all over again, we want to use existing research. In other words, pull together the groups who are already working in the field. And so we were all encouraged to form ourselves into a giant network. The reason being that the money was actually going to come from DG Research, and DG Research don't like to deal with lots of people. They prefer to deal with big networks, I think because it reduces the number of people they have to send nasty letters to. So we were all encouraged to set ourselves up into a big thing called the Network of Excellence, or COPEC. But the principal players, in terms of actually drafting, have been the study group on the European Civil Code and the ACI group, who provided the consumer law input. Though, as you can see, there were other groups involved as well. And in 2009, the so-called draft common frame of reference was produced. Most of you have probably seen the little red and grey volume, the sort of Bible, Chairman Mao type thing, which is widely available. If you're wealthy enough, or if your university is wealthy enough, you may have seen the full edition, which runs to six volumes. That's what's got all the commentary and the comparative notes in it. It costs hundreds of euro. It's co-published by Sellier and OUP. Now, <clears throat> the Commission is still not sure what to do. I have to say that after the DCFR, as the draft common frame of reference is normally called, after the DCFR was published, there seemed to be something of a lull. Many of us went to a conference in Stockholm organized by the Swedish presidency, which was frankly very flat. And we all thought, well, maybe after years we'll get some kind of legislator's guide or toolbox out of this. Any optional instrument seems to be very far away. But things changed rather rapidly. Partly because responsibility for the project was shifted from the Directorate General for Consumer and Health Affairs to DG Justice, with a new and very energetic commissioner who has decided that contract law is to be one of the priorities. So in July last year, they published a consultation paper, and the consultation is still open until the end of this month, which is one of the reasons <coughs> why I asked Michael if we could actually have this lecture in January rather than putting it off until later. And they set out a number of options. Of course, one option is always simply don't do anything. But the next option was to have a CFR as toolbox, and I'll explain what they seem to mean in just a moment. They have a variety of different forms that that could take, but essentially that's the idea. Or the European contract law could simply be a recommendation to member states, we think your contract law should look like this. Or it could be an optional instrument. Or we could have a directive which requires member states to harmonize their contract law as a whole. Or we could indeed 
they say, have a European civil code. Well, do we need any of this? Is any of it useful? Is most of it useless? Is it positively dangerous? The cuckoo in the nest as well. Well, I think we need to be quite clear. That paper, at least on my reading, is 90% wasted space because it's putting forward options which are not serious. The Commission has repeatedly said it has no plan for a European <coughs> Civil Code. And I honestly believe that that's true. They don't, I think, want a single European contract law. That's not on the agenda at all. I think the only two serious possibilities other than doing nothing, which is probably ultimately the most likely outcome, is that we have a toolbox and or we have an optional instrument. Those are the ones which are being, I think, at least seriously discussed at the moment. Now, <clears throat> let's explain a little bit more what each of those mean. What does a toolbox CFR mean? Well, as I said, this is supposed to assist in revising the acquis and in the development of any further acquis by providing common fundamental principles, definitions, and model rules. What does that mean? Well, we're not quite sure, to be truthful. We're not sure whether principles, definitions, and model rules is just a sort of composite way of referring to something that looks more or less like the principles of European contract law, or whether actually they're supposed to be different. And I think it's become accepted by the Commission now, as a result of work which we, the researchers, did, is that actually those differences reflect differences in purpose. Definitions. The problem is that very often directives and regulations refer to legal concepts which are not then defined in the directive. So for a classic example, there's a Simona Leitner case which went up to the ECJ where the package travel directive said that the consumer who had a poor holiday was entitled to compensation for her damage. Does damage include loss of enjoyment? Well, this was a, an Austrian consumer, and Austrian law doesn't give damages for loss of enjoyment of a holiday. Did it mean damage that you'd get under Austrian law? No, said the course of uh, the ECJ. It has an autonomous European legal meaning, and they held that it did actually include non-pecuniary losses. Well, if we had an instrument which provided definitions for these terms, that might be something useful. And you can think of other examples when a contract is concluded. Rescission, you could go on endlessly of, about terms that are not actually defined in EU legislation, although they're referred to. So the toolbox could be used by the ECJ or by courts in member states for purposes of interpretation. I think it might also help the legislator in member states who have to implement the directive. We have a very bad habit, I think, of simply implementing by copying out the words of the directive. So for us, the only problem is going to be one of interpretation. But if you actually try to implement it in such a way that the resulting law makes sense, and of course that's what part of what we were trying to do in the Law Commission report that you referred to, Linda, then you actually, again, need to know what it means. And so it would be very useful for that purpose. And of course, it would be even better if the legislator at the EU level specifically said, OK, we are going to draft this using the common frame of reference as a kind of legal dictionary. They could even put into the recitals. Unless it states otherwise, this directive is to be interpreted in accordance with the CFR. That might make things a good deal clearer, it seems to me. So definitions, I think, we can understand. Model rules. Well, they say we were supposed to find out what the best model rule is. You can see the quotes from the paper on, on, the, on the overhead. And put that forward, presumably as a kind of law commission report, if you like, recommending legislation. Except that a group of academics does not have the standing of the law commission. And I think that this would only work, and I think, again, this has come to be accepted, if the academics who are drafting the common frame of reference actually state this is our choice of the so-called best rule for the following reasons and the alternatives were x y and z in other words they must explain the policy choices whoever drafts a cfr has no democratic legitimacy to actually legislate so model rules you can understand Fundamental principles, well, we still don't know what fundamental principles means. 
Um, but in the co capital network, we took the view that what would be useful would be a general explanation of the underlying principles or underlying guidelines, which didn't actually necessarily make it into the text, but which were principles underlying the whole exercise. So, for example, you might explain that on the one hand we have freedom of contract and pactus and sabanda. On the other hand, there is sometimes a need to intervene to protect the, the vulnerable or to protect people who don't have adequate information when they enter the contract. Now, some people argued that those, that should actually be set out as a series of principles at the beginning. The French Association Henri Capiton produced a series of principes directeurs to be actually put into the CFR. But we found a problem with that, because very often these things pull in different directions. Freedom of contract, the need to protect weaker parties, so it's pull in opposite directions. It's no good just listing all those values and ignoring the conflicts. You need some sort of explanation of how to strike a balance between them. And we thought that that was actually better done in a discursive introduction, which is what we did. Skip that. Now, I want to say a little bit just about the content of the DCFR. Because if you look at the DCFR, it's absolutely enormous. You'll see that it actually covers all those topics that the study group on the European Civil Code was dealing with, plus the stuff that the ACTI group was dealing with. That seems to be a very far cry from what the Commission's documents were talking about. The way forward talks about the CFR containing rules of general contract law, consumer contracts, sales maybe, maybe insurance contracts. How come the animal became so big? Well, actually there's a very simple explanation. As I explained, this was funded through the Directorate General for Research, the reason being that DG Sanko, who were running the project, had no money for research. But DG Research doesn't operate on the basis of commissioning research. It's like a research council. You put in a bid, you put in a proposal, and they fund it or they don't. So naturally, we bid for everything we could possibly get, and more full then, they funded the whole lot. So of course, we got funding. So in other words, everything that the researchers thought should be included, and of course that happened to coincide with everything they were working on, was included. That very quickly led to a recognition that the DCFR was what is often called the academic CFR. It is just an academic product. And that sooner or later, a political, as it was called, CFR, a narrower version, would have to be devised. And the Council, the European Council, has always taken, I think, a very narrow view of what should be in it. They're talking about general contract law, consumer contract law, maybe sales. I think that that, however, is driven by thinking about the CFR as an optional instrument. If you're thinking about the CFR as a toolbox, something which is simply going to provide definitions and model rules, I don't see any reason to restrict it. After all, the mere fact that something is covered by the toolbox doesn't imply that you are going to legislate in that area. All it does is to provide definitions should they ever be needed. And if you look, think about what's actually covered by the existing consumer acquis, we're constantly running across things which are outside contract. If a consumer withdraws from a contract under a cancellation period, there are questions of unjust enrichment. Tort pops up, but not only in the product liability, but in pre-contractual duties and so on. And sooner or later, we may actually want to go further and have directives on security of removable property, one of the most difficult and unsatisfactory areas of European law at the moment. I'm not sure we will ever need a CFR to cover the law of trusts or the law of benevolent intervention, whatever that is, but I think most of it could perfectly well be covered. Now, <coughs> the idea, as I said, was that the common frame of reference was going to be used in the process of revising the acquis to try to make it less fragmentary, less inconsistent. But and the idea was that the two processes would work hand in hand, or preferably the CFR would at least be in draft form and then would be used as a kind of trial run for the CFR for revising the first directive. However, that wasn't what happened mainly because European politicians, like probably most politicians, are impatient. And they said, this is all taking far too long. We're going to be a priority to revising the consumer acquis. And from 2005, 
that became the priority. So the commission officials were instructed, don't wait for the CFR, get on with revising the consumer acquis. And that produced a green paper in February 2007, and then the draft consumer rights directive, which probably many of you have seen in October 2008. It didn't cover the full eight directives, it only covered four, distance and doorstep selling, unfair terms and consumer sales. And it was what they called a horizontal instrument, which I've always felt was a bit of a bit aspirational. It wasn't really horizontal, it just meant that it was slightly better coordinated than the, the other, and it was all in one document. Obviously the unfair term stuff is horizontal anyway, in the sense it applies to any consumer contract, but the distance and doorstep selling stuff, that continues to apply only to certain types of contract anyway, and the same, obviously, for sales. So was drafting the DCFR a complete waste of time as far as actually revision of the consumer acquis is concerned? Or did it have any influence? Well, the commission official in charge of the uh, revision of the, acquis, the consumer directives has actually said publicly several times that they got quite a lot of inspiration from the draft texts of the DCFR, which were then being circulated, maybe. They certainly didn't look at the detailed drafting. We spent a lot of time trying to tighten up the wording and make it all work better, only to find that they'd gone back in the draft, draft uh, com, uh, consumer rights directive to the old wording with all the problems. But I think the biggest change in the consumer rights directive was a novel. And that was the shift from minimal harmonization, which is the pattern of most of the consumer directives, certainly those which apply only to, to private rights, like the unfair terms or consumer sales directive, to full harmonization. And make no mistake about it, this is not a question of trying to give better protection to consumers. This is a shift of emphasis. This is trying to make it easier for businesses without reducing the protection that EU law gives to consumers to make it easier for businesses. Well, what's the problem? Well, the problem many of you will know very well if you've studied private international law. In a cross-border consumer contract, the parties are free to choose whatever law they want. But in certain circumstances where a business targets the member state in which the consumer lives, the consumer has to be given the protection of the law of the member state in which they are habitually resident. That cannot be taken away from them. And that in effect means that the seller, the cross-border seller, has to be familiar with the law of every member state that they're trying to sell into. In other words, have to know about 28 different laws. And that's a particular problem if you're trying to sell on the internet, when you may not even know where the buyer is let alone anything about the law of their country. And the Commission thought that we really need to try to increase the volume of cross-border sales to make the internal market work properly. Particularly, they're hopeful that internet selling might become much more common across borders, and they think that the differences between legal regimes are hindering that. Of course, they admit there are many other hindrances as well, but they seriously think that that is a hindrance. And I think, and this is only my personal view, I can't prove it by any means, but I think that that was the main thrust of the Consumer Rights Directive, but that the Commission has now abandoned that approach. Why? Because it doesn't really work. Why doesn't it work? Well, the problem is this. If you have full harmonization, no member state can give consumers greater protection than is laid down in the directive. That's the meaning of full harmonization. If you live in a member state where you don't have very good consumer protection anyway, it's probably not going to make much difference to you. But if you live in a member state which has a high level of consumer protection and suddenly there's full harmonization, that is going to mean that the consumer protection you had is taken away from you. And that was going to be unacceptable to many member states, certainly to consumer organizations in many member states. Though it would only happen, as happened to stress, to topics within the scope of the directive. But that in itself is a problem. What's in the scope and what's outside the scope? 
And indeed, if you're really trying to overcome the problem of divergence between national laws by full harmonization, you will need to have very broad scope for the directive. Otherwise, it won't work. But if you have a broad scope, it's unacceptable to the member states. So you have to reduce it to a narrow document, but then it leaves all the problems of divergence still there. So I think that they've more or less abandoned that approach. You may have seen on the 3rd of December, the Council produced a working party document with a revised consumer di uh, rights directive. It does still have full harmonization in it for most of it, but it is so limited now that effectively that's not a problem because it only deals with distant sales and what are now called off-premises sales. That's all it deals with. Nothing else. What are the Commission doing instead? Well, they're looking instead to the optional instrument, the idea that they should provide another regime which can be used instead of any national law. And they more or less, I think, adopted the notion produced by Professor Schulte Moga that we should have a blue button. Well, what is the blue button? The idea is that a business selling across borders, targeting, for example, consumers in France, should either have to give consumers the rights that they would have under French law, or supply on the terms of the optional instrument. And the idea is that the consumer would choose, if they say, I agree to accept the European contract law by pressing on screen a nice little blue button with 12 gold stars on it, more or less. That's the idea. And the optional instrument itself would then provide the consumer protection for the consumers, rather than them relying on the domestic national law. And what has happened is that an expert group has been set up. It was actually set up just before the Green Paper was published. And the expert group was asked to draft an optional instrument. But we were drafting, we were told, on an as-if basis, because no decision has been made by the Commission yet as to whether to have an optional instrument, whether to have a toolbox, whether to do nothing. And I must confess that at least most of us, I think, understood that when we were being asked to draft on an as-if basis, that actually meant we were to draft something which could be a toolbox or could be an optional instrument. But after the summer break, we came back to find a new head of unit chairing the, the sessions, and he announced that we're not interested in you drafting a toolbox anymore. We know what a toolbox would look like. It would look like a draft on the frame of reference. Well, that, we won't go into that today. But what we want you to try to do is to draft an optional instrument. We want to see if it can be made to work. So the expert group was told to concentrate on the optional instrument. It is to apply both to business to consumer and business to business contracts, cross border contracts in both areas. It is to be narrow, it's only to cover sales in the first instance, but it is to be drafted in such a way that other kinds of contracts could be covered in the future. So the general parts will be left general. They won't talk, for example, about the seller and buyer, because that wouldn't be appropriate if we were later to expand it to services contracts. So, it's a small optional instrument that the expert group is being asked to draft. Now, how would it work in private international law terms? The idea, as I understand it, and no decision has been made, it's not a decision for the expert group anyway, this is for the commission to decide, but I can explain what they told us last September and which they haven't, as far as I know, withdrawn. They are determined to adopt what they call a substantive law approach. In other words, the optional instrument would take the form almost certainly of a regulation, which would simply introduce into the law of every member state this optional instrument for use by businesses to business or business to consumer cross-border sales. In other words, it would operate rather like the Vienna Convention does in those countries which are bound by the Vienna Convention. It actually forms part of the national law. But whereas in the Vienna Convention, if you enter a sales contract and your country is one that has ratified the convention, you'll find that the Vienna Convention applies unless you opt out. Under this system, 
if you made a cross-border sale, you would be able to opt into the option mentioned. But it would effectively form part of the law of every member state. And that means that we bypassed Rome 1 and Article 6 altogether. Because it's no longer a question of preserving the consumer's rights under their national law. This forms part of their national law. And the optional instrument will itself provide the consumer protection. I might just add that they think they might have to put in provision saying that courts are not allowed to resurrect what are really thought of as local rules of consumer protection as being internationally mandatory rules which apply whatever the choice of law under Article 9. They, they don't want courts to start suddenly saying, oh, this is a matter of public policy. So, so for business to consumer sales, we'd have sales provisions, we'd have general contract law, and consumers would be given at least the protection required by the consumer acquis. They would have to have at least the minimum requirements, and insofar as there's to, to be full harmonization, and you can see that some full harmonization is still on the agenda, as far as that's concerned, it would probably simply be copied over into the optional instrument so that the rules would be the same. I say it's going to apply to sales. One of the things that is extremely difficult is the question of whether it should apply to installment sales. Because if it did, you'd immediately be into the consumer credit area. And not only would you have all the complications of having to build in all the requirements of the consumer credit directive, but you'd also want all that other protection that we have in the Consumer, consumer Credit Act, and which is not in the DCFR. So I don't think that's a runner simply because the work can't be done in time. But I think what is accepted on all sides by the Commission, certainly within the expert group, and I think also by all the stakeholders, is that if this is to work for business to consumer contracts, it's got to contain a high level of consumer protection. As I say, if you live in a, a state which doesn't have a very high level of consumer protection, and you were to choose the optional instrument, you wouldn't lose very much. But if you live in a state with a high level of consumer protection, everyone always says Denmark, though the Danes will say, no, 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 the Swedes are much worse than us. If you live in one of those states, if you were to choose the optional instrument for your internet transaction, you would be losing a certain amount of protection. So in order to make it attractive to consumers, to consumer associations, and possibly make it acceptable to member states governments where there is a high level of consumer protection. It, the optional instrument has got to have a high level of consumer protection, higher than the minimum standards required by existing EU law. But not, of course, as high as some member states because that would be unacceptable to businesses. We've got to strike some sort of balance. And indeed, we've set up within the expert group a, um, sorry, a consumer subgroup which is trying to work out effectively what to include, what not to include. And it's not going to be easy. I think we're actually going to have to set out a range of options, because after all, we are only a group of so-called experts. We are not legislators. The legislators will want to say what goes in and what doesn't go in at the end of the day. Well, is a blue button desirable for UK consumers? And I would argue it probably wouldn't make very much difference. Because actually, I don't think that the level of consumer protection in this country is significantly different to what's going to be in the common frame of reference. I'm not a consumer lawyer, I may be wrong, but it doesn't strike me that there would be a significant difference. The problem will come in those member states where there is this higher level of protection. And basically, I think the Commission has to try to sell this project in the form of a series of trade-offs. It has to sell it to businesses by saying the advantage from your point of view is that you would be able to have a single system under which you can sell to consumers in any member state. Of course, there is a price to pay. The price to pay is that for some member states, you're going to have to have a higher level of consumer protection than exists at the moment. That shouldn't be too hard a sell. The harder sell, I think, will be to the consumer organizations. The trade-off is consumers in some countries may have to accept a lower level of 
the trade-off should be more people will be prepared to sell across borders, so there'll be increased competition, lower prices, and so on. More price. And for some member states, that really is a problem, particularly some of the smaller countries tell us that actually there really isn't much choice. You know, you can buy a washing machine, but there are only two models available. I don't know. Now, of course, the Commission is talking about cross-border complex. But actually, I don't think it would stop there. If businesses are allowed to sell on the terms of the optional instrument to consumers in other countries, Surely they're going to say, but why do we have to use English law, or whatever our national law is, for domestic sales? Why can't we sell to everybody on the same terms? Besides which, we may not know where the buyer is, or it may be quite difficult to work out where the buyer is. And I think the question actually has to be asked, would it matter? Would there be any great loss if effectively this particular cuckoo, the business to consumer optional instrument, did push the other chicks out of the nest. I'm not sure that it would do a great deal of harm. But that's a question, it seems to me, not for the EU. That's a question for each national legislator. And the Commission has pointed out to us there's no point us discussing whether this should apply to domestic transactions because the Commission has no varies to deal with that anyway. So what about business to business contracts? <coughs> Well, the big question, I guess, is who might use it? <coughs> if we were to have an optional instrument covering <coughs> cross-border sales and maybe being extended later to supply of goods and services, okay, it would provide a nice, non-national, neutral system which could be translated into all the different <coughs> community languages, provide businesses with a single operating system they can use right across the EU, if you like. Now, I don't actually think that cross-border sales are a particular problem for larger firms. Why not? Well, first of all, if they're really large enough, they're not likely to sell cross-border anyway. They're likely to have a subsidiary in the target country. But even if they don't, most of these large firms have considerable expertise, or they can afford to hire it in because they're dealing with <coughs> large contracts where the cost of taking legal advice is relatively small in relation to the contract sum. And very often, they're dealing with relatively risky transactions where they want as much certainty as they can get and are not likely to sign up for some new and unknown law. I think, and I believe that other people <coughs> agree with me, but at least some of the members of the expert group and some people in the commission, I believe that we should aim this optional instrument for B2B contracts at SMEs. <coughs> because SMEs are not so sophisticated. They need, I think, rather more protection. Now you might say, well, okay, but why would anybody ever agree with the SME that they would use the optional instrument? After all, if an SME is dealing with a big, big business on the other side, and the SME says, I would like to contract on the terms of the optional instrument because it would allow me, for example, to challenge your standard clauses. Why would the other party ever agree to that? Well, I think we need to think about it rather like insurance. The SME may want the reassurance when it's making cross-border contracts that there's going to be a judge out there who's going to look after its own interests to some extent and be prepared to pay a premium for that. And if the SME is actually prepared to pay that premium, there's no rational reason why the other party wouldn't agree. They, in other words, larger businesses may find that actually they can get good deals with small businesses if they agree to allow the SME to use the, uh, the optional instrument. What would they like? Well, as I say, I think SMEs would like a degree of protection. I think they would like probably some sort of duty of disclosure to think about all the things they didn't think to ask about. The Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns, if you like. I think they would like some protection against surprising or harsh clauses. I think they might <coughs> like some sort of general duty not to behave badly, a duty of good faith. Now, of course, you might try and do this a different way. You might say, well, what we need is harmonized contract law for small businesses. But then you get into all sorts of difficulties, as we did at the Law Commission, in defining what is a small business. The joy of an optional instrument 
is that only the people who want it will ever choose it. You don't have to define who they are. So I'm actually reasonably encouraged that a B2B optional instrument can be drafted and might actually be adopted if it were ever, uh, actually, might be actually be used if it were ever adopted by the EU. <coughs> However, there is one major problem. At some point, somebody must have told the commissioner in charge, who is not a lawyer, that it could be done in 150 articles. Well, you remember once David Blunkett asked if we could have a criminal code which was small enough to fit in every policeman's back pocket. It's rather like asking the same thing again. It's just not possible. You can't have a proper law of contract that's in 150 articles particularly when they were already wise to the game of simply combining lots of articles into long ones. None of that is allowed. That means, I'm afraid, that at least the working model will be really rather narrow. It will probably only cover basic general contract law with a few consumer provisions and some stuff on sales. None of that associated stuff in book three of Peckle, assignment, prescription, and so on, none of that will be in, because there won't be room. Now, it seems to me that that is actually probably designed to make the project easier to sell, but it's likely to be self-defeating. We're back to the same problem. An optional instrument will only achieve the effect that they want if it covers a wide range of subjects, if it covers most of the issues which are likely to arise in a contract. If it doesn't, then the business, again, has to be familiar with the relevant national law, the law of the other country, the other party, probably. And I'm very frightened that this actually may defeat the whole exercise. However, there is a glimmer of hope. I wasn't at the last meeting. I couldn't get there because of the snow. But apparently, the group was encouraged to think larger. They were encouraged at least to consider whether we should cover not only the sale of goods, but services that are associated with the sale of goods, like installation, servicing, and so on. That suggests that the Commission itself is beginning to think a bit more widely. Perhaps 150 articles will go. Well, is an optional instrument of this kind, is it useful, or is it dangerous, a cuckoo in the nest? I think, myself, that for business-to-consumer contracts, it's fine. I don't think it's any real threat. What I would say about business-to-consumer contracts is that it's certainly not a threat. <coughs> we also need a CFR toolbox, because we're still going to have a lot of EU acquis, which isn't full of definitions. And I think we're also going to need to improve the consumer acquis, because remember, if the optional instrument is narrow, if it only applies to sales, we're going to have to have, continue to have consumer regulation to apply to all the other types of consumer contracts. <coughs> what about business-to-business -business contracts? Well, I think that's much more problematic. It certainly looks as if the optional instrument, in terms of its substantive content, will be very different to English law. English law, as you know, puts enormous emphasis on what some writers have called market individualism. I would summarize it, given the lateness of the hour, in three words, four or five words, stand on your own feet. <coughs> Contracting parties are expected to look out for their own interests. Why is that? Well, I think it's probably self-evident that there must be a pretty direct correlation between the nature of a country's contract law and the kind of case which typically comes before the courts of that country. Think about the contract cases that are litigated in this country and reported. A very, very high proportion of them involve large businesses, usually very sophisticated businesses, often they're repeat players. Or even if they're not repeat players or not very sophisticated, they're making high-value contracts where they can afford to use city solicitors 
to find out what are the pitfalls if they decide to accept the other party's law as governing the country. And again, they're very often in highly competitive markets where certainty is at a premium. That seems to me to have led to our very individualistic law. The CFR is going to look very different. It's likely to contain some duties of disclosure, even in B2B contracts. It's likely to have much more detailed rules. It's likely to protect more than we do against unfair contract terms. It's likely to have some elements of good faith. Now, I certainly wouldn't want that kind of a CFR to replace our law. Or for our law to have to be harmonized to match that kind of thing. That, I think, would immediately defeat our attempt to maintain English law as the law of choice par excellence for international contracts. Our law is designed for international contracts. Remember how pure we try to keep it. I don't know how, how many of you have read to the back of the Unfair Contract Terms Act. I didn't until I went to the War Commission. There's a little section in there which says it doesn't apply to international contracts. I didn't know. It's purely an attempt to keep controls out of international contracts. So we want a very pure, very certain law. But I don't think that an optional instrument would be a problem. Because, after all, an optional instrument is simply providing parties with an additional choice. It's actually no different to saying you can adopt German law or French law <coughs> if you want to. Many of those laws are much more protective. I think because that's the nature of the case that comes before the French and the German courts. You remember those jibes between comparative lawyers where the French would say, well, English law is law for tradesmen to which the response was, well, French law is law for peasants. Well, I don't want to get into trading insults, but there's a, a grain of truth in it. The point is that the kind of case that the French courts are dealing with far, often, far more often involves individuals or small businesses, and their law is, to some extent, suitable for that kind of case. We're different. <coughs> but an optional instrument wouldn't threaten our law. It would simply give an alternative for those <coughs> people who want it. It wouldn't be suitable for the typical contracting party who appears in the commercial court here. Not at all. And I would never expect them to use it. But it seems to me that there may be, and we certainly want to encourage cross-border transactions between <coughs> people who are never likely to get into the high court, who are never going to darken the doors of one of the city solicitors, because they simply are not operating on that scale. Small and medium-sized enterprises. They, I think, want something more protective. And it may be that even people who are used to contracting under English law would actually prefer, sometimes, to use that system if it gave them something which English law doesn't get. Given. So I don't see the optional instrument as, for business-to-business -business contracts, as being a threat to English law in any way. True, technically it will mean that some parties who would otherwise have contracted under English law will be contracting under the, the optional instrument. I ignore the technicality that it would become part of English law, but uh, they would be contracting under a different system. But I don't think that threatens English law, the export of English law, in any way at all. If they want to do that, we all believe in freedom of contract, why not let them do it? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much, Hugh, for a, a really clear exposition of what's an incredibly complex area. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions. If anybody would, would like to ask anything? Thank you. somewhere like Denmark or Sweden, yeah. where consumer protection may be better under the local law than under the yeah. blue button provision. Yeah. 
Is it envisaged that the seller will be will offer on terms that we're only selling it to you on the basis that you press the blue button and agree it is? Well, I think that, that the theory is that sellers may offer the choice. I think the reality is that they won't, or at least only those who are already selling across borders will do so. They might be prepared to continue. But if they're prepared to sell on terms of Swedish law, why aren't they doing so at the moment? It seems to me that the people who might be enticed into cross-border selling by this process are in effect going to say it's the blue button or nothing. In other words, you push the blue button or you don't get to the next screen. That, it's going to be as simple as that. Which is why I say that you know, I think that it would in fact be that many consumers would end up contracting on the, on the terms of the optional instrument. And that's why I think it's important that it has a reasonably good level of consumer protection. Uh, Bill, one of the things you haven't touched on is where particularly consumers, but also small businesses, are actually going to get advice on the optional instrument from. Uh, take the Germany example, I'm admittedly German, I'm going to buy here. Uh, as you rightly said, um, if one has a cross-border sale of goods case governed by German law, then the CI, the CISG applies unless the parties opt out. The problem, though, is that very few German lawyers had any actual practical experience with the CISG. As a result, uh, standard terms in Germany almost invariably exclude the application of the Vienna Convention so that uh, international sales of goods are governed by uh, German domestic sale of goods law. Now, the result of that is that if one does have a case where the CISG uh, uh, applies, which is usually because something's gone wrong, so the law applies, no standard terms have been um, put in place, there's really very few people you can go to to get advice on that, because your uh, median German lawyer won't encounter a single case in, in their whole professional career, even those who are regularly involved in cross-border stuff won't have a case once or twice a year. Um, and, of course, to learn about the CISG, there are enormous commentaries which one has to master in order to get the points. And you have exactly the same problem with an optional instrument. I mean, even if it's only 150 articles, that's still significantly longer than CISG. And uh, you'll have um, uh, the same problem that people, particularly consumers, but also a small business, just won't have anyone to get advice from. Yeah. Um, you may have noticed that, although I cut short the discussion because I have my hour on the clock, the last slide was headed threat or opportunity. And I actually think that this presents the English legal profession with an opportunity. Because I think that there will be exactly, I mean, if it were to take off, or in order to encourage it to take off, we would need to be, have, across Europe, access to people who do understand. And we English have a head start because all the documents are so far only in English. I think we could actually provide that kind of service. It would be a very different sort of service to the one provided by the big law firms at the moment, but those firms could, I think, actually uh, provide that service with no difficulty at all. I mean, the main problem that I suspect people have with the CISG is that they only come across it occasionally. If we could actually get this used regularly, then people would be specializing in it and would know it. And I don't think it will be any more complicated than the CISG. It hopefully should be less complicated than we know. Um, I think it really is an opportunity for the English legal profession to do something different, which wouldn't cut across what they do at the moment. So there's my answer. Um, we all need to sit down, write books about it quickly before the French and the Germans get round to it, and, and corner the market. The gentleman in the yellow jumper, just in front of you here. You, you touched at the end on um, what I think is a very important uh, point, certainly in the city of London law, and that's the, um, there's a sort of visceral fear of a European contract law, yeah. which always centers on this question of, oh, well, we don't, we don't want a law under which there's a, um, an obligation of good faith. Um, now, would you like to comment on what, what I think is the 
So actually, this is a, um, a completely bogus sphere. English law, in fact, through other means, already has those same provisions, whether yeah. as a matter of uh, fiduciary law in relation yeah. to relations agency or so on. And that this, this sort of what, what will be the principal objection to the UK is, is a bit of a issue. Yeah. Well, I think you're quite right to suggest that it, it, it's at least exaggerated. I mean, I think that the great difficulty is that we think of rules of good faith as being homogenous. They're not. Good faith, as far as I understand it, actually performs very different roles in different countries. I mean, in Germany, for example, an awful lot of doctrine has been built on the back of our, uh, Section 242, the good faith provision of the Baby Bay. But they have become, as it were, freestanding doctrines, which are relatively certain. It's a judge in Germany, as I understand it, is not sort of allowed to say, oh, I just don't like that. That's contrary to good faith. I'm not going to enforce it. I think in the Netherlands, it's a rather different story. Their courts are given much wider powers. <coughs> so the big question is, as it were, if you have a doctrine of good faith, what do you use it for? And in a way, I would say that actually good faith is more of a technique than it is. So that, I mean, Bingham was quite clearly right in saying we don't have a, a, a broad doctrine, we have a lot of particular rules. But even if you have a broad doctrine, the big question is what do you do with the doctrine? And some of us are trying to make sure that the doctrine of good faith in the optional instrument doesn't get out of hand. Because even in contracts between small businesses, <coughs> it could have a very unsettling effect. But I think you're primarily right that even if we weren't talking about SMEs, even if we were talking about contract law in general, I think the fear of the doctrine of good faith is itself is probably exaggerated. However, there are quite a number of other doctrines which I think might not be appropriate. For example, in German law, any standard clause, whether it's been used by, you know, IBM versus ICI, that can be challenged. I'm not sure that we would want to have that, because I think that does create too much uncertainty, possibly, or too many opportunities for arguments, arguments which can't be settled on the summary judgment. That's the, the problem that we get here. So I think there are other things that I fear much more than good faith itself. It's just a procedural observation. Um, the fate of the Consumer Rights Directive is no longer in the hands of the Commission at the moment. I mean, there's going to be a vote in the European Parliament's internal market committee at the end of the month. Yes. And there are hundreds of amendments. Yes. And although the outgoing Belgian presidency and the incoming Hungarian presidency thinks it can do a first reading agreement between Parliament and Council, that really remains to be seen. So some of what you've explained may not survive the vote. Absolutely. I mean, you probably know more than I do about what, what the problems have been. I mean, my understanding was that the reason it's become so narrow was that they weren't able to get agreement about this new commission to review the grey list of terms. And there was some problem in the sales directive, but I don't know what it was. Um, and, but because they couldn't get agreement on those, the council working party said, OK, let's just do the distance and off-premises stuff. Um, I think you're quite right. I suspect that the Parliament will try to get some of the other stuff back in again. But what I don't know is enough about the political situation. Maybe you can tell the rest of us what's going on. I don't know. Would you like to give him back the mic? Yeah, I was at a meeting yesterday in Brussels where the president explained that it was the opposition from the big member states to the Article 4 and 5 maximum versus minimum harmonization, which led to the presidency yeah. team deleting Article 4 and 5. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been a chance of an agreement. Right. And that was Germany, France, I don't know about UK, but um, without these articles, that's the only chance of getting it adopted and everyone is sick and tired of the text. So they're hoping by deleting Article 4 and 5, that could be the end of the matter. But in the European Parliament, it's difficult to read what are the red lines, and they will make, they will try to reintroduce some of the more sensitive issues. Yeah. Well, I think it, if full harmonization is the problem, then it seems to me that 
they are trying to bypass that by, I mean, I'm speaking pure, it's purely a personal view, but my personal view is they're trying to get around that by using the optional instrument. And probably the Commission won't insist too much on full harmonisation because they can see it's not going to get anywhere. Thank you. If the microphone goes to the person immediately on our last speaker's right, which is Tammy. Tammy, yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm very interested in the idea that it could be used uh, in business to consumer contracts and that it could be used in business to consumer contracts within the UK in a purely domestic context. And I'm trying to quite, I'm, I'm not quite sure I fully understand what is contract law and what is all the other panoply of consumer protection that we have in this country and how much you can exclude the second uh, by using the blue button. Um, I mean, just one of the ways forward that the government's now very keen on in consumer protection is ombudsman schemes. Yes. And we've seen, for example, that you can't run an estate agency without being a member of the property ombudsman scheme or some other equivalent organisation. Mm -hmm. And that applies to utilities and financial uh, services and the rest of it. If you press the blue button, would it mean that you didn't have to be a member of the Ombudsman scheme? Um, and how does it affect things like the way that we sell pharmaceuticals? Would you be able to get around various ways of all the ways in which you're not allowed to sell pharmaceuticals except in specified ways? What would, it, what would happen to utility contracts? I mean, even if you sold gas across border, does that take out? Which bits of utility regulation does it take out? I'm not quite sure I've fully understood which bits of all the huge amounts of law we have regulating businesses in this country you can get rid of with this particular button. I think that's a very good question, and I wish I knew the answer. Um, I think, for example, that what we have to talk about, of course, is the optional instrument being allowed to replace the domestic national law within the area of its scope. So on the face of it, the Ombudsman scheme is only about dispute resolution, not about substantive law. So it wouldn't be effective. On the other hand, if we had schemes under which the Ombudsman was doing the kind of thing that you and I discovered they were doing in insurance, where they were effectively, still are effectively, rewriting the law, then I think there might be problems, because I don't think that would be permitted. So I think there's a very difficult interface there. Um, as to the, the sort of the, the, the regulation about pharmaceuticals and so on, I think that there would simply have to be carbons. Now, I mean, it seems to me that that's going to apply, first of all, to cross-border sales. Forget about the domestic situation for a moment. Let's suppose that I want to order drugs online from a German supplier. Can they duck under all the regulations in England about selling drugs by simply choosing the optional instrument? Well, clearly, they shouldn't be allowed to. But how you actually define the car bounds is going to be extremely difficult. That's not a task we've been asked to address in the expert group, but somebody's sure enough going to have to do it. <coughs> it may be, quite simply, that they will begin by excluding any product on which there are certain types of restriction. You see what I mean? You, the, the optional instrument can be limited in its scope. Moving to the domestic side, I think it's quite simply a question of what the UK government would want to do for its own businesses, as it were. And I don't know whether they would be interested or not. But whichever way it is, it obviously mustn't undermine the kind of restrictions that you're talking about. And I don't think there's any intention that it should. But the sort of thing that they're more concerned about, for example, remember in the sales directive, there's this presumption that if the goods cease to conform within six months, there's a presumption that the non-conformity existed at the time of delivery. In Portugal, apparently, that was extended to two years. And, you know, it's that kind of rule that people or businesses may be worried about um, and that they want to try and get rid of. But as I understand it, if you're selling hunting knives, and if you're selling something like hunting knives online, you're not actually worried about consumer rights and defect, defects in your hunting knife. What you're really worried about, what's the big barrier to cross-border trade, is that you don't know whether these knives are going to be legal in all 28 or 27 member states. And therefore, what you want from this is some sort of indication that if you sell under this particular blue button, you'll be all right. Otherwise, you have the same problems in 
not knowing everybody's law. Well, obviously, um, that's true in your example, yes. But um, there are lots of products which you might sell which aren't subject to that kind okay. of restriction. Um, but I, I agree with you completely. Um, I, it's very difficult to know how to deal with it. And indeed, it's actually really quite difficult to know how you would deal with the whole problem of what I might call illegal contracts. Because, after all, the optional instrument cannot be a complete legal system. So there must be some sales which should not be enforced under the optional instrument because they're going to involve some illegality. Illegality by what standard? Well, I think it would have to be illegal in the place of performance or something like that. So if it's illegal to sell knives over 10 inches long in England, then the contract would be unenforceable under the optional instrument. There would have to be a reference, in other words, to certain aspects of national law, which is obviously difficult, but I think it's inevitable. Um, conversely, if you know, I'm selling you marijuana, but it's for delivery in Amsterdam, maybe that contract would be legal. Who knows? We'd have to think about it. We've got time for a couple of questions. Michael Bridge down here, and then this question at the back. Just um, I didn't actually put my hand up. Um, <laughs> 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 the opportunity is there, you can't resist. Okay. <laughs> um, I hope you're not thinking about knives, my <laughs> one twisting. <laughs> well, I'll keep it very short. What makes you think that the kind of person who might most want an optional instrument is the kind of person able most to insist upon it against the other party? And what evidence is there of traders declining to contract because the other party insisted upon national law as opposed to the UN Sales Convention? Well, in terms of evidence, it's very hard to come by. That's one of the problems. A lot of this has to be hypothesis. People say, yes, it is a barrier to a selling of abroad. We don't know what the other legal system is. Whether you actually, how often you actually get to the situation that negotiations start and then break down because of that difference, I honestly don't know. I suspect rather rarely, but I suspect there might be quite a volume of cases where they never even think about it because it, it's just all too difficult. That's the sort of person we're aiming at, I think. Um, so. There's a question there, last Now, sorry, the other point sorry. is it's not a question, I think, of forcing the other. The point is, as it were, I'm trying to, I'm prepared to pay a premium to get the extra protection. So I have to, as it were, bribe you to let me have the optional instrument terms, and I'll pay you a little bit more or supply the goods to you on a slightly better price because of that. Sorry, poor Michael Patrick Joyce at the back has been trying to get. <coughs> I'm a practicing barrister in, in London. Um, you helpfully sketched in the background and the history of all of this. And after this long period of time, I really have a rather simple question. Uh, and it's this, uh, who is this for? Because if one looks at the position of consumers, many consumer associations don't want it. And in any event, the consumer IP can be adapted as appropriate if necessary. Big business, as you acknowledge, doesn't want it uh, and won't use it. Uh, so really we're left with the prospect of an optional instrument of which uh, all indications from the Commission would involve substantive law by regulation. So that we would have an entire legal regime uh, simply for the benefit uh, of SME, is who was the last but one question that demonstrated. Uh, might not find any benefit because they still have to identify whether the contract is or is not legal or um, complies with national le uh, regist uh, legislation uh, and public <coughs> policy considerations uh, over and above use of the optional instrument. Yep. Is there any evidence that this particular group of people, the SMEs, that really want it, hard evidence as opposed to anecdotal, even if they do want it, isn't it disproportionate to have an entire legal regime simply for them? And in this age of austerity, surely it is going to be massively costly, which underlines the disproportionality. 
Well, let me take the points in reverse order. I don't see where the massive cost is coming from. I mean, the Commission isn't paying us, I regret to say, to do this work. I wish they were. Um, it involves you, like me, going to Brussels a few times. But um, the, the cost is not enormous, I don't think. It's no more costly than, as it were, becoming familiar with another legal system which might be used because a member state, a new member state has joined and people might think, oh, well, maybe I'm now going to be doing business with rural retaining. So I don't think the cost is enormous. I want to challenge what you said about consumers, to go back to the first point, because, of course, you are quite right that in the, uh, I should explain, there's a series of stakeholder meetings taking place, and um, Michael has attended some of those meetings. And at those meetings, the consumer lawyers present have said, we're not sure we want this because it will reduce consumer protection in some member states. But I personally don't think they have yet thought about the equation as a whole. I think that many of the smaller member states would actually welcome this. First of all, because their consumers wouldn't lose because they don't have very high levels of consumer protection. But secondly, because they really do suffer from lack of competition. There aren't many cross-border sales into Malta, frankly. Um, and you know, I think there might be real advantages. I think one of the problems is that so far we've only been talking to the consumer lawyers rather than to consumer associations as a whole, as it were. And I'm a little bit worried that they haven't seen the trade-off that I've tried to explain. SMEs, well, no, there isn't any hard evidence. The problem is that it's very, very difficult to find out what happens in practice, and particularly so when you're dealing with SMEs. I mean, we had this problem at the Law Commission, if you remember, when we were trying to find out you know, how would small businesses be affected by the stuff on unfair terms, and again, by the stuff on company security interests. Very few people speak for them. They're not well organized. So in a sense, I'm in the position, I think, of saying, well, let's create it and see if it works. I don't think it's going to be very costly. If it doesn't work, well, it doesn't work. But I think suck it and see, frankly. No, I wonder if I could just explain what I meant by the, the cost aspect. It was really thinking that if you have a parallel legal regime, you will inevitably have costs associated with establishing that legal regime. And uh, when um, Madame Labai was visiting this country uh, at the end of last year, um, I asked her about the position of an English judge applying the Ottoman instrument uh, and coming at it with all the mindset of an English judge. And the same would happen in France and Germany, etc. Uh, and her solution was to um, have judicial training programs uh, for 600,000 uh, people being trained. And it's really the cost associated with that exercise, which certainly is in the Commission's contemplation, that really, frankly, rather worries me. Well, I, I can't deny there would be a cost if they wanted to organize it that way. I mean, another possibility, it seems to me, would be for each country to set up a special chamber to deal with optional instrument cases, so that you'd only have to train a rather small number of judges. That would be a way of reducing the cost immediately, very significantly. But yes, there will be some cost like that. I just don't think it's that hard to understand, actually. I just don't think it would require that much training. It's not a complete change of mindset like the, the CPR or the, the Human Rights Act. I don't myself think it would be as expensive as all that. But obviously, you have a point. OK, I imagine that we could discuss these issues for quite a while yet. But uh, I feel as a good hostess, I should give Hugh a break. Um, and I'd like to thank him on behalf of all of us for taking the time to come and um, give us such an illuminating lecture. Thank you very much.